MacArthur Park Church, which is right on 410. Uh, you guys have probably all seen it, uh, just on the, the north side, northeast, of, side. northeast side of, of 410. And uh, they have been partnering with us in doing this lunch. And uh, would you give them a hand for bringing all the pizza in today? Doug's team and, and all these folks that are here in the front row uh, have come and, and brought the luncheon for the last four years and uh, just done a terrific job in partnering with us in this ministry because, uh, as I always tell you guys, they, they, they don't do it because they don't have anything else to do. They do it because they really love you and they're willing to sacrifice from other things to be able to come and share with you. So uh, Doug is going to share with us today, so please welcome him with me. I uh, thank you so much for that. I want to for sure uh, recognize I've got five people helping me this morning. Uh, you guys raise your hand. All of y'all have seen them. They have been very, very helpful to me, and I appreciate that very much. Um, today, I have uh, not stood in front of you before because I have always been kind of busy with a lot of other things in this process. But today, I decided I, I've got the, the process down. So I can, I can uh, do some other things, and so I wanted to be sure to talk uh, this one chance. And so since I'm from a church, I've got a church story I want to share with you. I thought that you might enjoy and, and find interesting. A mother took her little boy to church. Don't know where Dad was that particular Sunday, but Mom had him by herself at church, and he's a little bitty boy, and as things go like they always do, the little boy pulls on her arm in the middle of the service, and he, she leans over and says, What? And he says, Mom... I gotta go pee. Well, she's kind of bothered by that. And so she says to him, it's not right to say pee in church. So next time, just say whisper. So uh, we go on, takes care of business, goes through the next week. She's unfortunately sick the next Sunday. And so the man, the husband, takes uh, the little boy to church that week by himself, mom's at home. And so as, as Typically happens, the little boy pulls on his arm halfway in the middle of the church, and he leans over and he says, what do you want? And he says, I need to whisper. <laughs> to which dad says, okay, right here in the ear. <laughs> <laughs> so just a thought, I just want you to have a visual image there as you start this, this talk. Well, talking about church, how many of you, just asking, how many were in church on Sunday this week? How many folks were in church? I wanted to check because I'm going to be talking to you about some stuff about church. I know most of you attend. Um, even if you weren't there this past Sunday, I'm going to know how tests are and different things are happening. Uh, but also, I know that all of you are very interested in spiritual things and spiritual growth because otherwise you wouldn't be here. And the, the interesting thing about spiritual growth is um, it takes um, a, a lot of stuff to do that. Now, I have some advice I want to give you about that. But first, let me tell you a story. Uh, it's really a story on myself. It seems that the lessons that we learn the best are the mistakes we make the worst, okay? And that happened with me once I was a graduate student in Bible, and I um, had probably one of my most difficult classes at that time uh, called Old Testament Survey. Um, I was taking a teacher at that point uh, a man that's greatly loved at the school I was at. Hello, there we go. And um, uh, he was known for his sophomore classes. All the kids loved him, but he always got harder the older you got. And so sure enough, as a graduate student, it was a difficult class. Well, the assignment was to take an Old Testament book and teach the class one period on that book. And you had to turn in an outline with that book that was 25 pages long, at least. So it's a very significant piece of work. So my assignment I chose was the book of Isaiah. I haven't done a whole lot of work by that point on Isaiah, and I decided that, you know, this would be fascinating, and I'd get to learn a little bit. So I chose Isaiah, and I spent weeks, as you can imagine, preparing for this event. Uh, I worked on it, pouring over commentaries, Bible dictionaries, concordances, theological books, all on Isaiah. And I had read a lot uh, on that. Um, and so I remember distinctly the day that uh, I stood in front of class and I presented my paper. 
and my, my professor looks at me, and then he, he always had something to say at the end of everybody's talk. And he tore my presentation apart. I mean, he just split it wide open. And why? Because he pointed out something that's a very simple mistake, but was very, very important. And that was, I did not take the time to read the text of Isaiah. And he pointed out in some very important places, some very simple things that would have steered me totally different if I had noticed them in my studies. And so I learned a hard lesson that day. Uh, if I'd only taken the time to read the text instead of reading about the text, I would have been much better prepared, made a much better grade, and made a much better presentation. So today I only have one point I want to leave you with. Read your Bible. Read your Bible. Lesson I remind myself every time I teach. This past week, uh, in fact last night, I taught on the temptations of Jesus. So the first thing I did was to sit down and read the text. I needed to know what it said. In fact, um, I encourage everyone to read their Bible and to read it daily. Not read it just occasionally. Not read it when you get a moment, but read it every day. Read it at breakfast. It's going to change your life. Um, oh, yes. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 17 and verse 19 says, It is to be with him, and he is to read it all the days of his life, so that he may learn to revere the Lord his God and follow carefully all the words of this law and these decrees. We need to be reading the text. So let me make a few suggestions as you think about what do I do? How do I do such a thing? Some suggestions. Number one, read it systematically. Reading the Bible in an unorganized and undisciplined way against, often works against creating that consistent habit that helps you to grow spiritually. Also, reading the Bible systematically helps you to get through the whole Bible. Some people have favorite passages. They read over and over and over again, which is good. But you need to, to read through Numbers and Deuteronomy and Isaiah and those kind of books. Also, read without personal notes. Um, one of the things I did several years ago was I purchased a Bible when I was preaching that had larger print so that every day when I'm, when I'm speaking, I could look down and easily see what I'm reading. Well, I did that, and on purpose, I've not written any notes in it because I want it to be a text that I can read, and it has nothing in it. I just want to get the text at that moment. There's other places and other times when I read the notes and go back to my studies and do all those kind of different things. But I also definitely want to have a time when it's very fresh. Another thing you need to do, read the Bible in different translations. Don't just read one translation. We often have a preference for one. But all translations have strengths and weaknesses. But by reading through different ones, you can get a broader picture. You can get a more accurate picture sometimes of what the text is saying to you. So I encourage you to try reading. If you've got, a, like I do on my phone, a version Bible, you can read several different ones very, very easily and often compare what, what you're trying to understand. Another thing I like to say and do is to read the Bible aloud. Read it aloud. Do you realize that every single word written in the Bible was written to be heard. It was written to be heard, not read. Because every writer of that book knew that everyone would hear it and not read it. Why would they hear it and not read it? They were illiterate. Most of the people, when this was written, being written, you know, 80, 90% of society weren't literate. So they couldn't even read it if they had it in front of them. And so every piece of, of scripture was written to be heard. And so you should stand and read the Bible sometime. It's always kind of interesting. Plus you hear it a little bit differently. You understand it differently. Also, choose a reading plan and stick with it. Uh, the best day to start is today. And I have brought with me a reading plan that I've used for several years. I got it out of the Discipleship Journal. If any of you are familiar with that journal, it's a very good journal. Uh, but this one has you read through four different sections of Scripture each day. 
You have a reading out of the Gospels. So you're reading about Jesus every single day. You have a section out of the rest of the New Testament. You have a reading out of Psalms, Proverbs, and you have a reading out of the rest of the Old Testament. It's a good organization. I put it here for you guys. I've got uh, several uh, hundred of them, and so I hope y'all will come and pick one up. If you don't get one, you can always go to their website. They have it there, uh, www.discipleshipjournal.com. So I encourage you to check that out. But get a Bible. Many of you have reading plans on the Bibles on your phones or your iPads. Uh, use those things. They're very good for helping you kind of work through. But what's interesting is if, if you read your Bible 15 minutes a day, you can read it through in a year, 365 days. You get through the whole thing. Recently, I read a book called Move, and it's the result of a survey and study of a very large church in Chicago, the Willow Creek Community Church. They wanted to see what it took to move people from one level of spiritual maturity to the next level. So they divided spiritual growth, a little arbitrarily, but they did. You had to do something. They divided it into four stages. And so they focused uh, their study on how you move from each stage. You have one movement from the one to two, a movement from two to three, and a movement from three to four. And they wanted to know, what did it take to, to, for a person who is focused on growing spiritually, which we should be as Christians, how do we do that? How do we move and grow? And so they asked a lot of different questions. They got a lot of feedback from a lot of different people. And it was interesting. They found several different reasons for why you move from one to two. And they found several different reasons for why you move from two to three and from three to four. Uh, what was fascinating is there's one reason for movement that came up with each section, all sections of growth. And can you imagine what that might have been considering the, the basis of my talk today? Somebody say it. Read your Bible. Everyone in all sections, basically, they had to be in the text if they were going to continue to grow spiritually. Uh, it was asking of the text, what does it mean? What does it mean for me? Paul stressed the same thing 2,000 years ago whenever he, in 2 Timothy, uh, wrote these words in chapter 3, verses 14 to 16 to his protege Timothy right before he was killed. It says, starting in verse 14, But as for you, continue in what you've learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. You don't want to be a part of that. So um, that's what Paul said many, many years ago. So let me close with this little short story. Paul Dawson tells this story about himself. His family went to visit the Grand Coulee Dam in Oregon. Don't know if you've ever been there. I never have had a chance to be there, but this is it. They were surprised to see, though, when they walked up, that the visitor center was dark. So they thought, well, maybe it had tinted windows. But as they got right up to it, they realized, no, it wasn't tinted windows. There was no power. All the electricity was off to the visitor center. At which point, he thought, how could you have a visitor center right next to a hydroelectric dam creating all that electricity and you have no power? Well, basically, it came unplugged. So the question is, how could something so, so needy of power not be plugged into something so close and easy? And so if you're willing to take the time to read the Bible, you'll be plugged in to that unending, overflowing, power source of God. I encourage you, read your Bible today. That's all. Y'all have a great day. Be sure to eat more pizza. <laughs>